first of all, I'm very happy to uh, to be in. I'm not so happy not to be in live uh, because I'm in the UK, and as you probably all know, the UK is still uh, uh, restricting uh, travel in and out of Europe. So even though I would have uh, loved to be live there in in the hotel in Athens with you and have proper discussions on whatever may come up, uh, I'm still uh, restricted to my uh, working from home room here in the UK. Um, so unable to go there. Um, nevertheless, uh, I give it a try. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm sure that via Cathy we can uh, we can handle them um, in a virtual way like this. I appreciate that Smart Maritime Network is doing everything to keep these events running uh, virtually as we used to have them and now hybrid with some of you in the room and some of us uh, not. Uh, and hopefully soon we will all be in the same room again so that the world is uh, turning back to a little bit more normality. Anyway, uh, I, will, uh, I will give it a start. I only have a couple of slides and I make it a habit of uh, of looking back a little bit where we are um, and then looking forward about what is coming. Um, I do that all the time and uh, you will see that also in this presentation you will recognize something, which is good, hopefully, and then a few things that are absolutely new. Um, so first of all, acceleration of digitalization. Um, I'm sure you've seen this, um, but uh, once in a quarter, we look at uh, what all the vessels that we are serving with our platforms are generating. And well, we, uh, especially since the pandemic started early last year, but now about 15 months ago, you see a tremendous uptake in, uh, in the data consumption and volumes over the vessel. On average, the vessels that we serve via our platform are now consuming almost three times uh, or, or more than three times as much as they did at the start of last year. Um, and there's no end to this. Uh, I don't think it's caused by the pandemic, but at least it's magnified and helped by the pandemic. And, uh, and what you see is that digitalization in all kinds of facets is taking up much faster than uh, before this pandemic hit us. Um, why is that? Well, first of all, I think what the pandemic brought us is that we are looking at all different ways to see how things are changing. And somehow it opened our minds uh, to the realization that many of the stuff that we did and we took as normal can be done in an other way as well. Um, so that is one. So you see not only uh, ship owners, ship managers looking at it like this, but the rest of the world too. And predominantly all the maritime stakeholders around the operations of the vessels are looking into all kinds of ways to do more remote of what they did, uh, caused by the travel restrictions and the limit of access to the vessels. But everyone seems to be looking at a virtual anything. Um, halfway last year, when we were uh, well into the pandemic, we, did a, we still did a research on digitalization. We got a lot of the, uh, the stakeholders and users of our service um, uh, sharing with us what they think is, uh, is the most valuable to them. Um, we have that in a research report called Digital Uncovered. You can find it on our website. I would download it if I were you and read it because it gives the perception of your competitors and colleagues and, uh, and peers in the industry about how they use digitalization to their advantage. And uh, probably it will give you some additional insights here. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things is that if you, if you look at what happens in the industry, it's not a real surprise, right? Because basically uh, what happens at sea uh, happened at land just a little bit earlier than that. Um, and you see a lot of the things that already happened with, with big successful companies embracing uh, internet and digital, digitalization. And you see the same happening at sea now. And I try to unravel it a little bit. Um, it's, it's a busy slide. But I will give it a try uh, because this is a highly dynamic environment that we are all working in. Um, and if this would have been a couple of years ago, at least the industry itself would have been pretty stable. Um, but also that is not the case. Because if you look at the big uh, industry uh, needs, and I put them on the bottom there, I think sustainability is the, is the biggest driver of all. Uh, fuel transition, uh, uh, emission control, and the likes of are the biggest change in the industry that we saw for decades and that we will see for decades. And 
Um, digitalization, uh, as I mentioned, is, is big in that. Crew, crew as an asset, crew protection is, is a very large, and safety and security. Now, all of these are somehow bringing applications and, and new ways of working on board. And in the center of this slide, you see them mentioned, like remote maintenance, which is there for a long time already, uh, emission control, document management, uh, reporting, fuel efficiency. And you see, in fact, all the value-added manufacturers of hardware, bridge equipment, navigation equipment, and the likes, finding their way via an application to, uh, well, to bring you services. Services that will uh, provide cost saving operationally on board and services that will provide them a recurring revenue stream where historically they were selling equipment, uh, whether it is for navigation equipment or for bridge equipment or for engines for that matter, or, uh, or any kind of other equipment on board. That is a big driver. But then around it, you see uh, the wider uh, set of application providers that, uh, that are kicking in. New startups, uh, we have the vast belief that this whole digital uh, services business will be a $10 billion business in, in about 10 years from now. Many of the parties that will be very successful and large in that are startups today. Um, so you see them all entering the vessel. It's, so it's a very dynamic environment, but that's not all. Further out of that, uh, that ring there, you see uh, words like regulators, class, charters, bank insurances, uh, welfare organizations. And if I just pick a few of them, bank and insurers uh, governed by something called ESG currently, environmental and social governance. So they will invest, reinvest and refinance into vessels that are proven to be greener and more sustainable. Similar way, you see charters uh, uniting them. There's the Charter Association. More and more of these are putting a focus on how sustainable a vessel is that they are dealing with and they're putting, putting their, their loads on. So you will see there as well that uh, sustainability is kicking into the operational life of the vessel. And then you have regulators, class, and I even forget to, may, to mention port authorities and the likes of all of them right, um, will start looking into uh, the proof of the sustainability of the vessel. And eventually, all of them, the banks, the insurers, the charters, the regulators, the port authorities, the homeland securities, and so on, because of that, will have an influence in the day-to-day -day operational P&L of the vessel operator. So again, a very dynamic environment with a lot of changes because all these big topics uh, are just beginning to change the environment of the, the operator. And this will be a topic for the next 10 years. So you are almost sure that everything that will hit the vessel in terms of applications or technology will rapidly change even after the first appearances. And then, of course, crew. And you have wel welfare associations over there. Uh, the realization that for a long time, uh, the communication platforms have been underinvesting in taking care for crew. Um, realization that crew are the assets that need protecting uh, and that communication and, uh, and the likes in the form of training and monitoring and tools to reduce stress and uh, keep them socially active are very important to avoid errors and eventually also saving assets on board. So a lot of these things are real life changing and what it has in common is that there must be somewhere a data communication platform supporting this all in the center of this vessel. And because everything is dynamic, so many things are new, and even things that are in startup mode, um, that there's only one thing that you basically need to take care for, is that you have a platform that can host and change with you, host applications and change with you, a, a communication platform that will be there for the life of the vessel and that can handle new applications that come along, that can handle new needs or higher speeds of communication or real-time real data sharing or take care for IoT and the likes of. So whatever you choose, it is important that you have a platform that brings stability because if not, 
then you're only investing in an ever-ballooning IT department, um, reinventing the wheel three times a year for anything that comes along. So, and if we're talking about cost saving and staying competitive, that is the last thing that you would like to do. So, looking back at Immersat, the, the business that I uh, run for Maritime, um, I'm putting on this slide on a regular basis. We are now on about 11,000 installations around the world. It's, uh, it is growing almost like the data consumption. I'm very happy with uh, the trust that all the customers are putting into it. Of course, there are ups and downs, uh, and it's a journey. But by and large, uh, I mean, uh, a quarter ago, I was talking about 10,000 installations. We are now passing the 11 already, and there's no, uh, no slowdown in this. So I'm very happy and proud about uh, the, the, the customers that continue to take this and standardize on that platform so that they can face these challenges. It raises the question though about, well, if the number of customers is growing so fast and the number of data volumes is, is growing so fast, do you ha how can you handle this? Well, I'm very happy that, uh, that in fact, our roadmap on satellites is supporting this. Um, I'm very happy to work at Immersat and seeing that we started this journey on Fleet Express with three GX installations. In the meantime, we have uh, uh, provisioned and taken in the network our fifth satellite already. Uh, the fourth uh, satellite and the fifth satellite have in common that every time we launch a new satellite, they are more powerful than all the previous ones. And that currently we have another seven on order. And those seven satellites will all hit the orbit between now and 2023. And the very first new two satellites will be big and powerful because they will not only have uh, the KAGX uh, capacity, they will also have the L-band capacity because they're hybrid so that we can enhance both L-band and GX in a similar way. Because remember that Fleet Express is a, a, a hybrid service. Then, we will launch the seven, the eight, and the ninth, and they will all be electronic steered, so capacity can be allocated real time everywhere in the world, hitting the spots that are becoming busy in the meantime, so to offload them. And then, of course, in a, in a similar fashion, we will have two satellites that will do polar, so that we will bring the same wideband technology into the polar regions, opening the northwest and the northeast passage uh, before 2023. And it's all backward compatible. So I'm very confident that with the roadmap that we have, the fully funded satellites that are on the production uh, line coming into orbit in the next one, two, three years, that we can handle both the acceleration of in installations as well as uh, the growing demand for data. Then, it's not only about the technology and the way we are deploying satellites. It's uh, it's much more about what can be done with it. Uh, as I said, it's a very dynamic environment that we are in. A couple of years ago, we started recognizing that and looking around to see which application providers, regardless whether they are manufacturers of hardware for bridge or for navigational uh, um, uh, systems or providing uh, social or business applications, we were looking around and see whether they saw the same benefit in having secondary bandwidth of the same platform, making use of the built-in IoT functionalities of the platform uh, and the likes, or, or building on, uh, on APIs that we provide them. And what I just did this time is I put uh, quite a few of them that we have linked to us, that we are developing solutions together with, and remember that Immersat is not a software house. We are not an application provider. We are providing a platform that enables those who are good at software to do their job. And you see them mentioned here. The reason why they are on this slide is that this ecosystem is moving fast. And there's only so much you can think about when you're a ship operator or a ship manager where it comes to these new things coming to you. So what we did is because this is a variety of services, in technical, operational, social, and business application uh, areas that we set up a digital academy. Um, if you want to be part of that uh, and get connected to each of these uh, parties and, uh, and learn about the 
values that they bring to a ship operator uh, or a ship manager come to the digital academy from Imersa. Um, and there on a very regular basis, we will bring you these new ideas. And then you can take it from there yourself. Uh, so what we do is provide them application interfaces or secondary bandwidth or, uh, or, or IoT platforms, and they do the rest. So no need to uh, reinvent the wheel, I would say. Come to the Digital Academy, speak to those people. Probably a few of them are around where you are in Athens, uh, or you can speak to uh, one of the few people from Immersat who live on the continent and who could make it to Athens. Um, I think uh, Alberto is there from, uh, from Immersat. Speak to him about this, speak about the Digital Academy and how it could bring you new ideas. Now then, I will jump over to safety, because when I mentioned the big topics in the industry, like sustainability, digitalization, uh, crew welfare, and the likes, I left one out, and that is safety. And you know that a couple of times per year, we do a research, and we are writing a report uh, on that based on the outcomes. We did that recently for digital ferries. We did it recently for digital yachting. You saw already that I mentioned the digital uncovered. Um, probably you know from uh, last year, the trade 2.0 and the crew welfare uh, uh, reports, they're all available uh, for reading. It's background reading, but it gives new ideas. And now we did the same thing for safety. Um, what, uh, what it is, it is a research paper that is coming out uh, this month. Uh, you will find it on our website. It will be announced probably in the coming week. And uh, what we did for the first time ever is that we took three years of aggregated distress data and started to analyze what it has in common. Because we do distress uh, safety now for, for about 30 years, um, and never, I thought, a aggregated uh, distress data report has come out. So you won't see uh, individual cases, but you will see everything aggregated, and there's a wealth of commonality over there. And then on top of that, we reached out to many of the stakeholders in the industry uh, and we asked them their opinion about safety and where it should go to. Uh, and it all breeds collaboration and uh, new technology um, and protecting the seafarers. And um, what it does uh, as well then, taking that on board, um, we wrote a piece about how we see that safety could develop when using modern technology. Um, and that's a little bit of, of a strange, uh, strange thing because safety is something that is so part of our DNA that we almost take it for granted many of the cases, but realize that GMDSS is already there for 30 years. Um, and if you, well, and you all have an Immersat C on board, uh, and probably in the past you had an Immersat B as well or something like that. But the Immersat Cs are there for 30 years. The technology that we started it on is still very much alive. Um, and we, we see that copied, uh, or at least seeing attempts to it being copied, and that is all fine. But realize that this technology is 30 years old. Uh, realize what device you had in your hands for mobile communication 30 years ago. If you had any, probably not. Um, so I think it's high time that we look at the future of safety. And there's a lot changing in the definition of safety going forward. Because if you look at safety as it used to be, it is distress, hitting a button, and then the Immersat uh, satellites are preempted, and eventually you are connected to a rescue center or a coast guard, and then things will uh, unroll. That's all very reactive from, uh, from the, uh, uh, the aid perspective. So we were, uh, we were thinking back, uh, there are a couple of aspects that are added to safety. The very first one was the most obvious one, and I said that many times, uh, that is security. In Dutch, I'm Dutch, there are not even different words for safety and security. It's the same word in Dutch. Dutch. So I was always surprised that cybersecurity was not part of the safety look angle. It's the, the, it's the, the other side of the same coin in my, in my view. So we started launching uh, the fleet security portfolio in 18 and 19. But again, that's all looking back. Taking on board the, uh, the, the, the safety research that we did, uh, taking on board 
the, uh, the L-band um, uh, GMDSS that we have it currently on, we looked at what is coming along on safety. There's a social aspect. There is an environmental aspect. There is an asset protection aspect. There is a cyber resilience aspect. Stress reduction, training, behavior of the vessel. Think about predictability. Think about all kinds of geographical factors. Uh, and think about the big sustainability agenda that is coming in. So what we would uh, like to do based on the insights of this research uh, paper and uh, based on the possibilities of the new technology is we would like to bring safety from reactive to proactive, taking action before things happen, making alerts before buttons are hit. Still too many vessels are going down where never a distress button has been uh, has been touched. Uh, so you can imagine that um, that if uh, safety buttons are not touched within a certain uh, certain time, or when vessels are making moves or going out of bound of their parameters, that any kind of preemptive uh, signals are going out. And above all, when things are happening, there's a big cry for situational awareness. Now all of that can be solved by the combination of IoT, we call it fleet data as it is embedded in our platform, an IoT platform and wideband technology, uh, even on the poles, uh, as I just said. So in a couple of years time, when the poles are covered as well with wideband, situational awareness, wideband offloading of VDRs or even VDRs in the cloud for that matter, are not unrealistic to think about. So it's not there yet. We had a proof of concept in front of the IMO about uh, a, a automated safety concept based on our uh, IoT platform. Uh, I think it was impressive. Um, and we will start investing and building that out so that hopefully in a couple of years, we will can, can bring safety to a next level using the technology that is now at our disposal. Um, and that is the, the biggest message that I would actually have for today. So there's a lot happening on digital. It's very dynamic. Uh, the cost saving stage is well understood uh, by all kinds of applications coming in. But I think the big industry topic of the impact of sustainability, either on our, uh, our business, on our reporting, on our uh, the environment in terms of charters and ports and, uh, and bankers and insurers. And last but not least, the impact of sustainability on the further safety development. I think that is where the future of digitalization lies. Uh, the future is definitely wideband where it comes to, uh, to safety and it should encompass uh, many more topics than it does today. And uh, I, will, uh, I will make myself strong in going in that direction. And uh, the first proof of concept, as I said, were there. Um, that's what I had for, uh, for today. Um, I'm conscious that uh, I spent my 20 minutes uh, and that there is time for question and answer, I think. Cathy. Hi, Ronald, can you see me now? I can see you. Super, well, thank you very much for that. We actually have a few questions for you from the conference floor here in Athens. Sure. Of course. So, first of all, Ronald, are maritime authorities beginning to request direct access to vessel data from Inmarsat to monitor issues like vessel traffic and emissions? No, we don't own any data, of course, uh, Cathy. Uh, we are a telecom provider. Uh, the data is owned by the ship operators and the ship managers. And uh, they are deciding what happens with their data whenever an authority is... Uh, is, uh, is asking that. Uh, that's not our role. So everything that uh, that I said about sharing of data, I think it's important, but it's the ownership of the operator who is uh, taking that decision, not the telecom operator, as it is with any telecom operations in the world. Uh, and mm -hmm. satellite operations is not different to that. Okay, thank you. Um, another question for you. Um, you mentioned a tripling in bandwidth usage in the last 15 months. Yes. How much is crew use and how much is for operations? Well, crew is extremely large. Uh, there's no doubt. I think what the pandemic did over the last 15 months 
is make it clear that the crew are the community that was suffering the most from the pandemic. And I think uh, it's also to our doing somehow that where it was possible, we increased bandwidth or lowered barriers to communicate for the crew or get access to uh, any kind of help or social assistance. That has driven uh, crew communication uh, to the roof. Uh, I don't have the exact uh, split in my head, but yes, a big portion of that uh, is crew. And um, I think also um, it is highlighting the importance of a platform. And as I said in one of the previous sessions that we had uh, in, in Smart Maritime, Cathy, is that it is important that the platform that you have on board is capable of splitting the three major components of the traffic. There is the business usage and the business applications. There is IoT, sensory information and the like. And then there is crew. And I think you should have a platform that is capable of splitting this stuff so that mm -hmm. if you have a package, either from us or from anyone else, that your crew communication is not suffocating the rest of the traffic. Yeah. And it has the potential to do so. If you just look at, uh, at YouTube and streaming downloads and whatever, if that is not restricted or confined, then it has the potential to eat all your allowance uh, or all your speed. And uh, that has to be managed and monitored. So I'm a big advocate of splitting all that traffic and making sure that streaming services like that are consumed by the crew in a reasonable fashion and limited and yeah. that the business usage is using what it needs without being restricted by the crew communication okay brilliant um we have a few more but i think we've only got time for one more question unfortunately so um probably one that a few people would be interested in with the new ceo taking over and in mass that recently yeah. has there been any shift in strategy for maritime or any other shifts or changes that um, might be of interest to the industry and our audiences? Uh, no, not really. Um, so um, I think the, the company was uh, well strategized. Uh, and uh, yes, we have a new CEO, um, which is a, a new breed uh, and a new heir. Of course, Rupert was there for, for nine years. Uh, Rajiv came in, he's a well-seasoned uh, senior uh, uh, executive. Um, and of course, he, uh, I think in the first three, four weeks, he was asking me every day about how the strategy on maritime, it's pretty complex as you saw, um, but uh, I have no uh, reasons to assume that that strategy will change at any time soon.